Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to London and talk with Sandeep Jaitley of bullionbasis.com. Sandeep lectures throughout the world on Austrian economics. Sandeep, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thanks very much, Max. Sandeep, I wanted to get you back on because you tweeted recently, and I quote, if it ain't Menger or his direct student, Eugene von Beebe, it ain't Austrian. Sorry, Mises, respectively, too many mistakes were made. Mm. Now, the reason I uh, wanted you to comment this is that many Americans consider themselves Austrian school libertarians, but most will be following Mises. What are his mistakes? I think his mistakes are probably too, uh, too great to elabor elaborate on, sort of on the show. Um, but essentially, Mises didn't look back to uh, Menger's original axiom, which was that value is not outside of your own consciousness. And he didn't observe what Menger observed about market action in the sense that there are always two prices. There's, there's a bid and an offer. And um, von Mises didn't like um, to, to admit that interest was a market phenomenon. Um, he sort of wanted to imply that it's a a sort of a natural consequence of, of, of not having a present good, basically. Um, so to develop a theory of interest without going back to Menger's original observations is not continuing the tradition in the Austrian way, um, as we would see it. So it, 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 it's not insulting or denigrating what von Mises has done. He was certainly the greatest economist of the 20th century. It's just that he made a slight few um, errors of observation. That's all. Well, well, the reason this is interesting, and I'm bringing it up here, is that um, this idea of value does not exist outside of mankind's consciousness. Hmm. This is pretty much the opposite of objectivism, which is Ayn Rand's philosophy, yes. to which many American libertarians adhere, and they cite von Mises as their justification. Yes. So this idea of objectivism is diametrically opposed to the true Austrian school of economics, so that would be a Absolutely. fundamental flaw in any so-called libertarian's philosophy. Absolutely. And the amount of guff that you read that tries to associate itself with um, Austrian economics and Ayn Rand, I mean, it's remarkable. Um, von Mises himself made the mistake of confusing um, the, uh, the, 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 the thing that occupies an object um, with the object itself. So um, he made the mistake of saying that a promise to gold is exactly the same as the object of a promise to gold. And if you sort of stop and think about it, that isn't quite true. Um, and the same applies for the whole philosophy of Austrian economics generally. Gold does not have intrinsic value per se. Um, it has value because it satisfies human ends. Um, and it is, it is, it's the means by which those ends are satisfied. It doesn't have value in and of itself. And that's a big mistake that um, a lot of libertarians or people who call themselves um, libertarians make. Right, I wanted to also ask your thoughts on uh, what I call fake libertarianism, because you hear a lot of folks in the US who ascribe to von Mises purportedly, but they're actually when you scratch the surface more of the fake libertarian variety. Mm. And this comes up quite uh, noticeably and this, I would imagine, is related to price discovery and what you're talking about, bid, offer, and interest rates. Mm. They don't include certain externalities mm. in or the, um, the actual by use of force, uh, yeah. which, of course, would be against the whole idea of libertarianism oh, to yeah. uh, realize an economic gain. So, in other words, when you have companies that are supposedly free market, who are in the oil business and they don't exclude they don't include the externalities of the pollution that they're creating or the cost of that pollution they are by force subjecting other people downstream to deal with the consequences in many cases deadly consequences of the force of those externalities putting being pushed on those people so again a major failure by libertarianism if, yes in fact it's supposed to be associated with this idea of uh, von Mises and free markets, et cetera. What, what, what are your thoughts? 
Uh, Max, I, I don't want to, uh, to, to, to paint a bad picture of von Mises. I mean, it's a perfectly honest mistake to make, um, confusing the object with the, um, the ends that it's satisfying. Um, but it's not, an, it's not a mistake that I expected someone like von Mises to, to, to weave into his economic theory um, so, so masterfully. Um, so that's all I will say on von Mises. Okay, well, if you strip these things away from the current crop of libertarians in the U.S. that are informing the Ayn Rand school, the Paul Ryans who are now on the Republican ticket, you can't, they're not really libertarians. They're no, not no. really Austrian economists. What, what are they not. then? They're fake, what, what are they? What would you call these people? I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't really given much thought to what I would name these people, but um, Austrian economists is certainly not um, one of them by a very large measure. I'll have to give it some thought, but it won't be a kind uh, nomenclature. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> All right, now, uh, Sandeep, in your latest uh, bullion basis newsletter, you write, quote, money is gold and silver, money is nothing else. And yet when Ron Paul asked Ben Bernanke whether gold is money, the chairman responded, no, it's a precious metal. What's going on there? Well, respectfully, um, Dr. Bernanke is, is wrong in that regard, um, but he's not, he's not unique by any measure. Um, money is the universally acceptable ultimate extinguisher of any debt. Um, and as far as I can tell, fiat credit, um, which is the system that we have currently, doesn't, doesn't fit that bill. Throughout time, the universally accepted extinguisher of any debt has always been, ultimate extinguisher I should add, has always been gold or silver, nothing else. That is the definition of money. Um, so it doesn't take much thought to realize that Dr. Bernanke is wrong, plain and simple, he's wrong. All right, so we have clear evidence of this because the US has a debt problem and Bernanke's solution over there at the Fed is to adjust monetary policy at attempting to extinguish the debt, not with gold and silver, but with more debt, essentially. Yes. And yes. that for our, the, what he's doing cannot be considered money. No, no, not at all. You can't, you, can't, um, you can't extinguish credit by issuing more credit. You just end up with a larger amount of credit outstanding. Uh, so, yeah, I... I don't know whether Dr. Bernanke realizes this in the back of his head. I'm sure he does. He's not a, he's not a dumb individual. Um, but the consequences of what he's doing, I don't think he does realize. Or in fact, any country that's monetizing their debt to this degree, they do not realize the consequences of what they're doing. And there will be nothing that they can do once, once everything starts kicking off, once everything starts spinning. What I want to make very clear, Max, is that you don't need marginal quantitative easing from here for asset prices to start escalating. You only need what has currently been printed to just start spinning more quickly. And once things start spinning, nothing can slow it down. No, no central bank will be able to slow it down without sending the whole world economy into the second dark ages. All right, so now, of course, going, if you take post-World War II, American economy, there's always been this tension between escalation of debt and GDP growth. Mm. And for decades, there was on balance GDP growth in spite of the escalating debt. So for a while, America was able to get away with this escalating debt. Mm. But now we're, we, we see a period where it, what's happening is, is directly outlined in the Austrian School of Economics, is mm. that when you achieve a certain debt saturation point, mm. you enter into a debt spiral, and the attempt is to, is to satisfy or to extinguish the debt with more debt, which creates this debt trap. Yeah. And is that, in, in Menger's view, did, was he the, the first to articulate that aspect of the Austrian School? Oh no, Menger, Menger was never, never that market orientated or that specific in his observations because you must remember the time that he was writing, none of the shenanigans that we're currently doing were happening. Um, there, was still a, there was still a gold standard there were some issues with silver in Austria, specifically to do with Menga and the, uh, the Austrian Empire, but Menga couldn't even comprehend what we're currently doing. Um, 
So it wasn't on his spectrum. It was on the spectrum of the later so-called Austrian economists like, uh, like von Mises. So let me, let me jump in here for a second. So what we see the break then uh, from Menger to von Mises really, as we go from a world of gold to a world of fiat banking and, and um, fractional reserve banking, where it appears as though von Mises has attempted to shoehorn Menger's ideas into a new philosophy, which is interesting in its own right, but not, you can't really confuse yeah. it with real Austrian school. No, you can't, you can't. And, and another thing that uh, is often, uh, that, that people often get wrong is that once you have gold and silver, which is, um, as I said before, the universally accepted ultimate extinguisher of any debt, all of the obligations that you have that come across through the course of business are denominated in gold. And those obligations which are closest to expiry, to liquidation into gold, you can count as near money, not not money. And those instruments which take a long time to liquidate into gold, like treasury bonds or long-term corporate debt, is less money-like. So the amount of obligations, the amount of credit in the system has no restriction to it per se. It's only bounded by how productive, how innovative we are as a, as a species. Um, so extending credit does not cause boom and bust cycles. It's when you extend credit beyond the, uh, the duration for which it was intended. And that we actually understand more colloquially as borrowing short to lend long. It's when you don't match the purpose for which the credit was taken with the purpose for which the credit uh, was granted, basically. That is a much bigger problem. Well, let's, let's take that a step further because in London now, the banks in London are under extreme pressure having been exposed to the scandal of rehypothecation. Mm. Forget about mac matching your uh, short <laughs> and long uh, credit obligations. They're reloaning the same security out an infinite number of times, yeah. leading to uh, a total collapse in the UK banking system and economy. So it's beyond even the uh, mismatch of obligations. It's, it's become an outright fraud uh, yes, where fraud. there is no collateral whatsoever. It is fraud. Borrowing short to lend long is fraud because you're, 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 you're disobeying the principles of a bailment, which is that a demand deposit should actually be accessible at all times. So you can't have your money available at all times and earn interest on it. The two don't make sense. Yet we, the people, are willing to accept things like this without questioning them. So we get what we deserve in the end. Okay, Sandeep Jaitley, we're out of time. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. I hope the so-called libertarians like Lou Rockwell watch and learn. Thanks very much, Max. So do I. <laughs> All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Sandeep Jaitley. If you'd like to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.